Uh, we're going to have uh, a lot of fun. I'm Marty Kaplan. I'm the director of the Lear Center at USC. And I have to say that not hearing a hiss after USC is really an exciting moment for me. Yeah. So, so thank you. Um, the panel that we have here today could not be better uh, than any to address the topic we're going to be talking about. Uh, I'm going to introduce them to you, and I'm going to ask that you, at the end of all the introductions, applaud wildly rather than, you know, halfway during the, after each one, okay? Um, I'm, I'm delighted that uh, uh, a couple of people on the panel are old friends whom I haven't seen in a bit, and glad to see them again. Bill Mechanic uh, now is the head of Pandemonium Films, his own company. Uh, he has also produced, uh, for example, Coraline, which I suspect many of you know. And he co-produced the 82nd Academy Awards. And before Pandemonium, Bill was the chairman and CEO of Fox Filmed Entertainment, which meant that he was overseeing all of the studio's uh, operations, <laughs> including feature film production, marketing, distribution, and worldwide for Fox Video, Interactive, licensing and merchandising, and Fox Music. Uh, Mike Metavoy uh, is currently still chairman and CEO of Phoenix Pictures. Uh, he is uh, a He's a, a, a name to conjure with in Hollywood. He is the co-founder of uh, a, a great studio, Orion. He was the chairman of TriStar. He was the head of production for uh, UA. He's been involved with more than 300 feature films. 16 have been nominated and seven have won Best Picture. And uh, I wanted to mention two awards that he's received out of many. Uh, one is that in 1997, he won the Career Achievement Award from UCLA, and in 1999, also from UCLA, he won the Neil H. Jacoby Award, which honors individuals who've made an exceptional contribution to humanity. Janet Yang is the president of Manifest Films. Uh, she, in her career, has been involved in every aspect of filmmaking. Uh, uh, some films that uh, you may know uh, of hers, The Joy Luck Club, uh, People vs. Larry Flint, uh, one that she's been up to, is up to now currently, which we're gonna hear about, I hope. Um, she has figured out a way, she's made a passion of, uh, bringing new talent to people's attention in the industries, both in China and in the US. She is the producer of High School Musical China, which came up a lot during the morning's academic panel, and I hope it comes up uh, again here. And uh, she brokered the sale of the first American studio movies sold in the Chinese market. She's also been named one of the 50 most powerful women in Hollywood. Uh, Peter Xiao is the pre founder and CEO of Orb Media Group. Among the things that Orb does is it manages the Shaolin franchise as it moves through all of the various media platforms. He's also uh, twice uh, chaired or co-chaired the US-China Film Summit, which is a, a premier venue for talking about uh, and, and, and showing uh, films. And he also is involved with the brokering of deals, the financing, uh, and it has a special relationship with the China Film Corporation. I've left a word out of that, China co-production. Co um, and so uh, he brings uh, that experience and uh, it turns out that Steve Saltzman is his lawyer. Uh, Steve Saltzman is a partner at Loeb and & Loeb, uh, and he represents uh, producers from the U.S., from Europe, and from Asia, uh, production companies, studios, distribution companies, broadcasters, di digital media companies, banks, film funds, directors, and, ta and talent. 
uh, both the legal side and the business side. So when you hear about these deals, uh, and uh, he, he makes them. Um, so at this point, please join me in welcoming our panel. Um, we're going to be sharing microphones up here, so uh, uh, a very informal uh, situation. And I'm going to I'm going to start by asking Bill a question, and so that's why the, the mic goes to you. Um, I want to start by talking about the whys of uh, the U.S. being in China and the film business. And so, uh, if say I came to you, Bill, and I say, boss. We've got to be in China. Everybody's doing it. There's a huge market. We've got to be on the ground floor. We can get around the quota by doing co-productions. They've got infrastructure. They've got talent. There's lower production costs. What do you say? OK, I'll go back uh, 12 years when I was running Fox, and people said that to me. <laughs> What'd you say? I said, go ahead and do it. You'll get old before it happens. <laughs> And 12 years later, it's just, you know, you're at the, you're at literally at the tip of an iceberg. These things take, especially when you go to radically different cultures, take sometimes forever to do. There's mistrust, there's, you know, everybody, I guess the easiest way to look at it, everybody, in a sports analogy, everybody wants to be the passer, and nobody wants to be the receiver. So U.S. producers or U.S. studios are looking for, well, studios are looking for dumb money. They're looking for sources to make movies um, where people don't know what they're doing so they can get them made easier. When you go into a country like China, that's close to impossible because of all the bureaucracy and the kind of weighing through it all to find what it is that the bad business will evolve to. Uh, is, is dumb money a topic that everyone knows here? You should learn it if you want to be in Hollywood. So, especially if you're an investor. Yes. Pass <laughs> 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 your investment. Dumb money is you want you want the is a, Hollywood has run for if, if you put Mike and I together, our ages together, it's still been it's longer than that. Where um, essentially Hollywood runs on the greater fool theory that um, Hollywood burns its way t through different countries through different resources, whether it, and it's not like picking on China or picking on Japan or picking on Germany, because it'll pick on Wall Street, it'll pick on anybody who has money that thinks that they're smarter than you are and they're gonna make, they're gonna make money in Hollywood and they don't do their homework properly, generally. Um, and, the, and there's a boot hill of all those people that have died over the last 70 years, you know, and very little to show for it. And again, it's a very good business or there would be an industry. Uh, so, Mike Manavoy, you are now involved in movies and China. Uh, yes, I am. I'm, I've got uh, a couple of projects with the Shanghai Film Group. Um, you know, in, in part because uh, I lived in, I was born in Shanghai, and therefore I felt that at some point in my life, uh, if I was going to go 360 degrees in my life, I should go back and, you know, do a, do a couple of projects in China and a couple of projects in Chile where I lived for 10 years. So I now have those on my agenda and I'm probably going to get those done within the next year or two. Um, you know, I think I'd like to take this um, look just a little differently. I, you know, in most businesses, it's, there, there's a seller and there's a buyer. And there's a reason why each one is in the position that they're in. In this case, you know, China, which is, uh, has become a major economic power in the world, is trying to figure out, and very proud, by the way, of their industry, because they've made huge strides in the last few years. Um, they're building theaters. They are conscious of the fact that people are going to the movies. I actually, when I was there not long ago, I asked uh, 
a uh, gentleman, I said, you know, ten, twelve dollars for a ticket. I mean, that's a lot of money. You know, why, why, uh, you know, how, how, how do you do that? He said, well, he said, you know, there's not a lot of people going to the movies. I said, well, what is that? What does that mean? Tell me how many people are going to the movies. Not a lot of people. I said, well, what's not a lot of people? He said, I don't know, 125 million. Uh, you know, the scales are different. Um, so, they, you know, they, they're, they're a series of issues, I think, that the, that the Chinese government has its, has its eyes on. Forgetting just the fact that it's money and they don't want to be dumb money because let's face it, you know, it's like a French producer, or a produ you know, production company that with a lot of money said to me, you know, I invest my money, I invest my money, and somebody's making money in the, uh, in the film business, but I'm trying to figure out who, who is this that's making money? Because I'm investing my money, I don't see any money. The, in, you know, there, there is the issue of, as China enters this new century, of seeing the benefits of soft power, of understanding what it means to be able to get your message across, what it means to entertain the audience that you have, what it means to integrate a whole raft of people, uh, you know, millions of people, into society that, that is essentially growing with economic power. And, you know, the, the number of theaters that are being built in, in, you know, I think someone said three a day. I mean, I think their goal is to get to 50,000 theaters within the next five to ten years, which, apropos to a number that was mentioned, is only 30,000 theaters in the United States. Uh, and incidentally, I'm sure that a few are closing as we speak. Um, so there is this mutual need, and the key question often is in China, because they, you know, is how how far is this going to reach? How far into the, you know, into the culture? How how far are we going to reach into it? I mean, we're now living in an era in which, and I don't I don't want to take too much time, so I'm going to slow down a little bit, but. It, you know, when uh, information access, by the way, I don't know there's why. A, there's a soundtrack. That, uh, yeah. Could it be from that video that is playing so, behind us? The soundtrack is a performance house on Korean Oh, great. Oh. <laughs> Maybe we should all go out there and get in the thing. It doesn't matter. I mean, I'm, if somebody else is bothered by it, it's, you know, maybe you should. Yeah. yeah. At any rate, um, you know, so they, they're, they're watching um, what comes in and what goes out and how far they can hold it together before it gets out of hand. And they don't want any of this to get out of the hand. They just, they know that they have to give and they'll continue to give and successful, su successive, um, you, you know, uh, regimes. But for all intents and purposes, they do a daily uh, scan of the population. They pretty much know what, how far they can push it and how far they're being pushed. So L Literally, they do a quantitative study. Yeah, they study. do. They do a quantitative study every, every single day. So they know basically you know, what people are thinking out there, what, are they, what do they want, and how, fa how far can they go without getting themselves out of the box. So, you know, my... Um, my interest in it, of course, was to, was to do, you know, go back into China and do a couple of films. And I made a deal with the Shanghai Film Group, uh, in part because I'm born in Shanghai, and in part because they were interested. Interestingly enough, they were interested in a, in a topic, and here's another issue and problem that I think exists within the configurations of how you get how you try to get movies made there, and how what kind of movies can be made, what kind of movies can be sent there, what kind of movies can come come back here. I think um, Steve will, will explain all of that to you. Um, you know, they were interested in in the Jews in Shanghai, and I was one of the Jews in Shanghai, and so they thought that I would probably be do the right film on the topic. Now, within the within the 
and I'm going to be a little more micro as opposed to macro. Within that, they still have to deal with their own cultural preferences, their own, cult their own cultural issues. You know, yes, we helped the Jews during World War II, but we want you to tell our story. We don't want you to tell the story, that story. We want you to tell our story. And so you're trying to figure out how do you tell a story where you can combine everything because they're forgetting the issue of censorship because I, I went there during the making of Shanghai. What I was hoping was we can hold it there, you got bring it. some more voices in, and then pick up some of those threads, okay? So, get those <laughs> so uh, uh, Janet, you've heard a, a, a couple of interesting themes raised, uh, including what's in it for who, and I'm just wondering, in, in your experience, what are the things to be weighed in, in working or not working with China? Well, I think from Bill we heard the corporate perspective. So from the Hollywood, and it's inevitable we are in America, in Los Angeles, the capital of movie making. From the studio perspective, yes, if you pick through money that can be available to the world, China offers that opportunity. But I think that is, in my opinion, a limited perspective because actually I think what's happening on a global level is that the, there's a whole shift of power in general to China. So from the Chinese perspective, they're coming back into their power and Hollywood is another area for them to help enhance their own society. So there is, and I think actually for the first time, Hollywood has really met its match. What China today has is money, is, uh, is earning and spending capital. You know, people have money to invest. I mean, we're talking vast amounts of money. We're talking a lot of spending power, of a growing middle class, and we're talking a, about a rapidly, rapidly growing film audience that has been not, that has been somewhat deprived for a long time. So the opportunities, I don't think, have ever existed in this way before. And naturally, Hollywood is paying attention. Hollywood does still have a lot that China wants and needs. There are, I find that, for instance, screenwriting. There, it's very hard to find good Chinese screenwriters. They don't know how to structure. There are certain things that, that work, you know, that are tried and true formulas, if you will. And the Chinese respond to those as well, but they don't know how to create that. Uh, the marketing skills that have been developed here, management skills. So there's a lot that the Chinese need to learn, but there's a lot that the Chinese have to offer. And in a way, it's, it is like an even playing ground. Now, I do feel that the, the opportunities are very complementary and that the, the, it is uh, for the first time. I mean, back in the 80s when I was bringing Chinese films over, I had to tell people there was such a thing as a Chinese film industry and there were Chinese filmmakers and we were very lucky if we got into a film festival and whatnot. And now the Chinese are making films for their own market that are crossing the $100 million mark. And I feel that somehow $100 million makes Hollywood listen. So yes, okay, now, now we have to pay attention because they have $100 million making, you know, films that are making that much money. So, and uh, because the, there is a limit to the number of films that are imported into China, as probably most of you know, and the limit to the percentage of the box office that American films can, can actually repatriate, there is this mechanism called co-productions, which allows you to make a film in China and have it be a Chinese film and enjoy the same profits as Chinese films. And I think this is probably, for the moment, the best opportunity that exists for those crazy people like myself who actually enjoy working over there because it's challenging in different ways. And, and the challenge, as Mike, I think, attested to, is finding films and content that can be appealing to both. Some, some people have chosen, for instance, Fox has chosen to make films purely for the local market. Others, Legendary is going to do big international films. So there's the full range of opportunities for what kinds of films you want to do. But for sure, it, it's interesting, it seems like China wants, everybody wants the other. China wants its films to get out. Western, a lot of American companies want to get their films into China. And somewhere, you sort of pick, pick your battle, you know, there's a full spectrum of opportunities and pick whichever path you want to take, but they exist. Thank you, I want to get back uh, in a few minutes to what you're working on now and, and what you're learning from that. But Peter, sh should, should every, film entity, every indie, every studio be involved in a co-production in China? Are there reasons not to do it? Absolutely not. I, I don't think, uh, you know, 
even though China is happening in such a major way, it's certainly not for everybody and not for every major movie. For instance, the American independent films, I think, simply could not find a market in China. And I would even say that the smaller budgeted movies that um, many, many people are excited about, it's just uh, they're really facing a, an enormously hard challenge in China in finding screen time. I think the, the challenges we've had here with independent films are being experienced in China across the board, unless if you have a certain scale, you have the various talent attached, uh, you simply, it's very, very hard to break through there. Um, but I think there's what a... Are the, what are the barriers? I have to ask that question. What do, you, what do you think are the barriers? Would Black Swan have worked there? No. Well, I, I don't think so. Mike, since we're recording this, if you wouldn't mind using the mic, is there one? Well, can you... let me finish. But what, I mean, no, the, but there's a no, there's yes. a, there's a larger conversation. When I was talking to James Cameron, uh, we had an opportunity to spend some time together, and I was urging James to make uh, Avatar into a co-production, which he actually agreed to. He actually agreed that you know what, it's blue people. These uh, the blue people are neither Chinese nor Americans, and that these kind of movies actually work. So I think that the studios are really taking a serious look at China and saying, you know what, we're really all about the tempo movies. These movies are enormously expensive. These are $100 million production budgets. Now, if you look at the delta of uh, Avatar grossing $200 million in China, and as an imported film, they push the limits from a usual 13 to 14 take of box office to about 17. But as a local film or a co-production, co they would have earned probably north of 45. And if you consider the digital rights, the, the kind of integration campaigns that's happening, the sponsorships, we determined that the Delta out of China alone would have been, would have been north of $120 million to the studio. Now, the, the Chinese would have different reasons why they would want to do it there. They would take pride in welcoming these kind of global franchises. So I think that um, this has really now hit a trans transformational point that yes, there are cultural barriers, there are a lot of things, but if you can imagine X-Men, for instance, say if Wolverine happened to be Chinese, you know, I think, I think things are gonna get a lot more creative because the economics are so huge. And uh, I would just wanna talk about something personal. I started at UCLA uh, studying political science, uh, thinking that I could make the world a better place. So it's really with that intention. Uh, in 19, 1997, when I went to China to make the first ever Hollywood Chinese co-production, it was a personal journey. It was really asking the question, can the East and West coexist? You know, can we share these stories? And as Mike has already pointed to, these are challenging. There's archetypes, there's a lot of history, there's a lot of baggage that's being broken down, but uh, these things are being met with on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, I think there's a great global market to align interests. And uh, you know, as a Chinese American, I really value my Chinese heritage. And I went to China really thinking, I'm really fascinated, I'm curious. I want to know what this 5,000 year means. And I think the world is asking the same question. So there's a way, and that's really been expressed in cinema through martial arts and fantasies. And so if you look at, if you put those set of eyes on, you can see that it's already a global business. That there are mechanics, yes, there's challenges, but to the degree that they can be overcome, I think uh, there's a fabulous opportunity where Hollywood and China can have their parts. And that's a very, very specific kind of approach. And that's the approach we're taking at Oregon. Mike, you were going to ask a question, but if I could, just I want to bring Steve into the conversation yeah. first so we, we all have a, a chance just to, just to begin. So Steve, uh, people are uh, beating their ways to your door to make deals. Um, do you ever turn anyone away? Yes, when they don't understand the marketplace that they're looking at, when they're trying to fit the proverbial, you know, square peg in the round hole. Somebody comes to me with the films, and this is an actual real world example where producers came to me with a film that was incredibly violent, uh, involved a mafia-like story, which might work from a Godfather-esque standpoint, but they were actually hoping to mount it as a Chinese co-production, hoping that they would get Chinese money, and I had to say, look, you could make that in Hong Kong, perhaps. You're not gonna make that as a co-production in China. Um, there are certain themes, you're just not gonna get them across. There are certain subject matters, they're not gonna work. We're still dealing with a marketplace that has significant censorship. Um, so, of course, there's gonna be those moments where you're turning people away and saying, 
that's not a good idea to pursue as a co-production. That's not a good project to pursue as a co-production. People also take for granted that our stars are their stars. Um, and that if you have a certain A-level star in a movie here, that this is a worldwide brand, and this person, male or female, is also gonna be known in China. That's not necessarily the case. A lot of our big films that have been worldwide successes and that have made some worldwide celebrities that have certain actors and actresses have not been distributed there for the very same reasons that I'm talking about. Either censorship, wrong subject matter, or couldn't get in through the quota. So people will come to me and say, oh, well this person is guaranteed to be, if we have them in this movie, this will be big box office in China. Well, not necessarily. So of course there's gonna be those moments where you turn it away. Mike brought up something. There's a lot of complex themes here. And, and Mike raised something, would Black Swan have been successful in China? Maybe, maybe not, but there's a lot of flex points. I just had this conversation with a, China, a, a client who is in the distribution business in China. There is a sophisticated market going segment, and we were talking actually about Woody Allen's Midnight in Paris, a movie that has had a certain amount of worldwide success, and there is a certain but very small segment in China that might appreciate that movie. And my clients certainly did. And they were really loved the idea of trying to bring that movie to a Chinese audience. The problem is, commercially, it just won't work. There isn't a big enough audience for them to spend the Princeton advertising money, to spend the marketing money, to try to make a film like that work in China, not yet. And conversely, we have the opposite problem, which is let the bullets fly which did $120 million of box office in China and is a really fun, rollicking, Robin Hood kind of uh, film that I've seen. Here, zero traction. It's got a tiny little distributor. It's basically a foreign language film as far as the market's concerned. They don't know who the stars are. Very hard to market. How are you gonna get these big Chinese box office successes into a US marketplace that treats them as foreign language films, that doesn't understand them, and frankly has very little appetite for foreign language films in general. So these flex points, what does the US want from China? What does China want from the US? It's all about figuring that out. Mike, you were gonna ask a question? Well, I mean, I'm going back. Mike, yeah. I'm going back to the issue of, uh, you know, would Black Swan work there? You know, I think that that question gets asked in every case, I mean, I had Black Swan for 10 years before I got it made, and everybody turned it down. And when I showed it in China, I walked up to an audience of about 1,200 people, and I watched it with them. They got the same feeling about the movie as people here. It was universal. The funny part, you know, I remember going to China once, and I think I'd just finished Shutter Island or something, and. And I said, Is, are, are they gonna play Shutter Island here? And the answer was, well, I don't know. They're not gonna play Shutter Island, but I have the video. You know, I'll show it to you. I said, you don't have to show me the video. I made the movie. <laughs> you know. uh, I mean, the, the, the problem is, you know, it's interesting because you look at the, the American film model today. It is, there's a chokehold to, movies getting made. And the chokehold is essentially the distribution apparatuses that come out of the United States. They only have so much money to make movies. Let's take it as a round number of billion dollars. They have, out of the billion dollars, I would assume that, they, that 500 million comes from other sources, meaning you know, partners of some sort, some fund somewhere. Uh, they spend another $500 million in P&A, which comes back. Prince They're, and ads. This is Prince and ads. They, um, and, in, in, and there's a vigorish for them on the Prince and ads, as Bill can tell you. You know, they, they buy, buy it by the bulk, therefore they get the discount, and they buy the, the advertising by the bulk, they get the discount there, so they're, they're basically pocketing that money before you get to see anything since the Advertising money comes back. Print, print advertising money comes back first. The same is true in the, the chokehold that the, it exists in the Chinese market. Think about it. 
You know, they only allow 20 movies, but then you have a few movies that can slip in. It, it's, the audience is not the one that decides what movie gets done. It's the, in this case, it's the chokehold that the majors have. And in that case, it's the chokehold that the government decides on what can get in, what can't get in, how it gets divided. You know, they're going to control that. It's not, you know, so anyway. I, Janet, you, you. I was just going to say something very simple, which is whatever we're saying today is not going to be true tomorrow. And by that I mean things are literally, where we are today was not predictable. It, nobody, I defy anyone to find someone who could say 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that the market would look like what it did today. So I think there will be an art house market in China. There's a new art house cinema in Beijing. And you know what, it's every, the kids are growing up and they're stuck of everything. So they probably heard about Black Swan, they read about it online, and there probably could be a significant audience if, if the film were to get out there because there are a lot of young people in China who are very hip and want to not see the commercial movie just like here. So. You know, I'm just saying that it, it, we don't know. I don't think we know. I think people, everyone's trying to figure it out, but I think there, I have seen people's lives take so many interesting left turns, the market explode in different ways, so I, I just, you know, that was Bill? I think, uh, well, I think what Jen's saying is true, but <clears throat> where the internet and there's a democratization of information and it travels around the world very quickly, so the, <coughs> The, you can't market a movie in a, in a country that's going to change. But the broader thing that I want to say is when I was saying people want to be passers, they don't want to be receivers, it's everybody in the U.S. wants to make a movie and export it around the world. Everybody in every country in the world is very much like what you're hearing out of China. They want to make movies, but they're most interested in exporting them. How do I make a movie outside and get it outside of my borders? Nobody wants to be the catcher. The world wants to be passers. The U.S is really not, when you say Hollywood, Hollywood is, is the one kind of melting pot that exists. That actually, there is no Hollywood. There's no American influence. Half the companies have been owned or will be owned or have been owned <coughs> by foreign interests. The, you know, what, when I was running Fox, when I looked for directors, I always looked to get an international director onto an American project because that made it less American. And what, what was clear to me is the US was 5% of the world population. You're not going to survive on, on in your boundaries, even here, because the costs keep going up and up and up. So if you're going to make a if you're going to make a five million dollar movie in the U.S., you're, you're you're fine. You'll be you'll make your money back in the U.S. If it travels, no problem. If you make a five million dollar movie in China, probably no problem. If you make a hundred million dollar movie in China, you have to get it out of your borders. If you make a $200 million movie in America, you have to get it out of your borders or you're going to lose money. Here. I think that number is 30. So I think most Chinese distributors have gotten together and decided that 30, is, 30 million US is the magic number. Now, if they hit the jackpot, it was just I, I understand. I'm not trying to, I'm just kind of offering some thoughts there. But I want to just kind of pick up where Janet has, has, uh, has left, which is, um, you know, there's this adage that when you go to China for the first time, after a month, you want to write a book. <laughs> and uh, after a year, you decide that you don't know enough, you're going to write an article, maybe. Maybe a blog post. And after several years, you've given up the idea that you know anything. <laughs> it's kind of where I'm at right now, frankly. So it is to that point. And having had access to the regulatory process, first getting the, our first co-production approved, so I went before the censors. I went through the endless script changes and notes and, and the edits and now advising co-production, the co-production co corporation on these kind of approval processes and being behind the other side of it, I would say it's not that simple. There is no government with a capital G. In fact, it's a highly sophisticated, nuanced, competitive, complex process. Now the masters... So of, people need to hire you <laughs> to that's manage not, that. That's not what I was saying, but... but, um, but it's not it's a bad idea. Really yeah. <laughs> I'd appreciate it. But, uh, but the point is, I think the most sophisticated players on the China side, they all know how to do this ta bian qiu. It's a very, very famous thing that anybody who knows how to do anything daring knows how to you know, just kind of skirt the issue. They know exactly how to mold it, they know how to position it, and ultimately many of them are quite successful in pushing these taboo boundaries. 
so that the system is not as ironclad as one would think, you know. Case in point, Ang Lee made Los Kashin as, a, as an official Chinese co-production. Just think about that, you know, with everything that they've, they've told us that it can't be. And there it was, it was made. Yeah. Then it was banned. But, but the thing is... And I worked on the reverse, yeah. Peter. Yeah. I worked on a project called Shanghai, right. which was also intended to be a co-production, was in pre-production in China, and which got the word, it's better off that you leave, go produce somewhere else, even though you're in pre-production here, because you're not going to qualify as a co-production because of the aftermath of Lost Caution and some of the themes. Well, so was, that film... Was, so this what I'm saying is, it's ebbing, well, it's ebbing and left. flowing. It's, it's ebbing and flowing. There's no absolutes. The story gets even better, though, because yeah. that project went, shot in Thailand, moved all of the facilities, yeah. built sets, shot in Thailand, and then was ultimately admitted back in, as opposed to being banned, as an official co-production. So, so the forest, that's the point. Yeah, yeah, but meanwhile, of course, they... You know, they they didn't exactly let it really go out there and perform. They can they basically can control they control the theaters. They can, they can figure out how many theaters it can go into, and that's the end of that. So, you know, I, I mean that was a personal thing I think toward Harvey as opposed to anything else. Well, I would take issue with that. Like everything else. Of course you do. You represent Harvey. <laughs> no, I don't. Actually, I don't. <laughs> oh, okay. I in, in that deal, I represented Ye Brothers, okay, well, the nice. Chinese company. Okay. So, and they had a deal with artists. I was in that conversation. I, I, I was with the regulators talking about it, and I'll share this because it's so far after the fact. The people who watched that film thought there was, a, there, was a, there was an element of the Chinese experience, the Chinese people, how they feel about themselves, were not fully expressed in these characters, and there was, there was something that troubled them about the way these characters came across in that particular context. Well, and, and it was only, that's part of it. The other part was the ending in which the Japanese guy happens to survive and do a nice thing for this for these two people so they can leave. But I think that's it, where we're kind of getting off the point, really. Well, actually, well, more, the, the, more the, to a commercial point, though, which is you mentioned governmental controls and the chokehold that we have here in the U.S. market. You have a lot of the same commercial slash governmental issues that you have in China. You have the overlay. You have the governmental overlay. So there can be a blackout where a Chinese movie is going to be the only movie, or certain movies are going to be the only movies you're going to see in theaters for a certain period of time. And that has an impact that obviously is very different from our marketplace, where it's going to be the commercial realities of which movies are in the marketplace at any given time. So you have all these different overlays, going back to the ebb and flow point and Janet's point about not knowing what it's going to be like tomorrow. You have the commercial realities of what's in the marketplace at any given time and what is it competing with. You have the cultural realities that Peter just mentioned, which is, are there aspects of the film, the character depictions, the story, the subject matter, that are going to be difficult for a Chinese market to swallow, or conversely, for an American market to swallow from a Chinese film? And then you have the further complication of the government overlay, and how is the government dealing with what's available in the theaters in any given window. So it's those last two that I'd like to ask Janet about in your own experience, the cultural piece in terms of the creative content and the government overlay, which is interested in the creative content. I've made, I think five, I've shot five times in China. Uh, first time was with Steven Spielberg, 80s. That was a not a co-production because that was uh, based on the J.D. Ballard, it was Warner Brothers, and it, well, there was just no way the Chinese were ready to take on that subject matter, World War II, Japanese as a co-production, but it was a sister production, we shot for three weeks, et cetera, et cetera. So, but they were very supportive, they basically shut down the whole city of Shanghai for us. We shot part of Drill Club there, which was also a sister production, we shot, I shot part of Dark Matter, which we got to a big argument with the director back, because he thought, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely not, they would never approve this subject matter, which was about a Chinese student, is based on, or inspired by a true story of a Chinese student who came over, and he ended up killing himself and a bunch of people at a university. Um, you may know. Um, but they did approve it, surprisingly, and I have, I knew some of the reasons why. Sometimes it is personal relationships, they really help, sometimes they, whatever. And, the fourth time was a Chinese version of High School Musical for Disney, and that, we had 
zero. Although both Disney was very, 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 very nervous about the Sharpay character because they didn't want her to be an aspirational character. She lived in a huge mansion, wore fancy clothes, and was generally very spoiled and obnoxious. And they thought, oh God, what if people, you know, so they, Disney actually was much more stringent about, about the content than was Hawaii Brothers or Shah Bumbang, which was the uh, other Chinese partner, Shah Hamidi Bu. So, uh, and then finally there was zero, zero uh, issues about that. My latest production was something I decided to do because I really, really wanted to show China as it is today. I was, I am very tired of what I think is the detrimental effect of seeing so many movies from China that are set 100, 200, 500 years ago and thereby giving a lot of people who've never been to China the impression that maybe there still are rickshaws or there's just a lot of people on bicycles or whatever. Even a movie like Karate Kid, which is set in modern day Beijing, you never once see a high rise. How can you shoot in China, in Beijing, and not see a high rise? It's all just little alleys and all the bad guys were Chinese. So I really, it's very frustrating to go there and, and also experience with a people, you know, directors or actors that have taken over, whoever, studio executives, they, they see China and it, they, they're shocked because they absolutely had, were ill-prepared based on what they've read in the media and what they've seen in movies. So this latest production, I said I was going to do the impossible, which was try to make a movie. It is an independent movie. Try to make a movie that would be pleasing to both Chinese and Westerners that would be acceptable and authentic. No, nobody could say, oh, that would never happen. We were not intentionally poking fun at one person or another. And it is a story that could happen today, but was also meant to be funny. So uh, China film groups saw a cut. They are telling me, anyway, that they like it very, very, very much. They think it has commercial potential. We are just starting to, uh, we're going to start getting it out there, we have a sales agent, et cetera, et cetera. So it's an experiment. It didn't cost that much money. It's not a $100 million experiment. But I do feel that it is different because it shows China, it, it's, it's based in Shanghai, it seemed to constantly be drawn to Shanghai to shoot. And it, uh, people, when we've screened it internally, people are riveted because Shanghai is a character and they're like, oh my god, I had no idea that's what Shanghai is like. I want to follow up uh, something I read that you said about the way in which storytelling is different in China and uh, in other markets like the U.S. So uh, I'd like you to explain the difference and how did you deal with that when you made a movie that's meant to be attractive to both? Uh, well, they were very attracted to the script because it was very tight story thing. I think the Chinese audience, especially the youth audience, is attracted to a lot of the same films that the worldwide audience is. That's the good news for everybody. We all like films that, are, that tell a good story. And the Chinese just have not had that in their history. They're, their novels, their plays, the different forms of culture that they're used to tend to be even more the oral tradition or more reverent. So this idea of a very well-structured three-act script is not something that comes very naturally to them, but they're, they respond to it in the same way that audiences have learned. Yeah, and, I, and there's certain things that I think are kind of interesting, you know, in films. You can go back to the beginning of, of even silent films. Sight gags, action, um, you know, work. I mean, it's just people are interested in seeing lots of things going on on the screen that say action, because movies are about action. It's that's what it's that's what it's about. And a good story attached to it that interests them is obviously going to work. I mean, the banana peel will work here. Will work in France. It'll work in Europe. It'll work in Turkey, it'll work in, you know, wherever. But you're about to make a drama, or you are making a drama. Well, I, you know, I, I know what the limitations, but it, the, the drama is really on the television side, and that's, and you know, that you can understand, because on a smaller screen, you know, it's the characters that matter with some action. But in the movie, I, I decided I wasn't going to do a drama. I decided I was going to open this movie up, I'm going to take David Lean, as an example of you know somebody who's you know I'm going to take Dr. Zhivago and I'm going to figure out how to do the Chinese version of Dr. Zhivago, and that's basically what I'm doing. 
maybe one way to look at it is go back to our days at Disney. I mean, I built two distribution organizations, one at Disney, one at Fox. When I went into Disney, Disney basically did not really distribute their pictures around the world, the animated films. But what Mike was saying is, is absolutely true, that, that what I saw in an animated film is you, because you have to get a ch children as an audience, you have to go back to the silent films in a lot of ways. They're very visual films to communicate to kids non-verbally. And what I did was then take those pictures and hire people in each country to dub them so that they, you couldn't tell the difference that they weren't other than the characters and some of them are not, you know, most of them are not humans anyway, but when, when they weren't human, you couldn't tell that it wasn't a Chinese picture or a Japanese picture or a Ch Chilean picture, a Spanish picture, a whatever, and the box office of those pictures then exploded. Disney on something like um, before Little Mermaid was the first one to really break, but um, whatever that one was before that, probably did 50 or 60 million dollars and all the money was made in America by, you know, and then I went to Fox, we did Ice Age. When you, Ice Age is now the biggest film, animated film ever overseas, where it did 800 million dollars overseas. I mean, the ability to not be American, not to be English, not to be French, not to be, you're a citizen of the world. So the more visual that filmmaking style is, in a three-act three structure, you're telling a kind of classic story structure, but you're not doing this, is to me the, is the most common ingredient of things that work around the world. So Peter, are we in a globalized market or are we also in a Chinese-American market? Well, it's, it's all of the above. First of all, China is such a big place and the, the, the film business all over the world is such a big place and I think there's really so many different niches and corners where everybody's point of view ought to be either tested or embraced. So it just comes down to taste, what kind of story you really want to tell, what does that story require. There's certain things that absolutely will not work. But then there's many, many other things that could and it's just, I think it's just kind of have to find that thread within that particular project. But, you know, I, I, I can't talk about China in, in a big, big, you know, China with a capital C. It just, I, I don't think that, that really works. But now, in terms of narrative storytelling, I think there are some philosophical differences. For instance, if you study Chinese, the Chinese classics, you know, there isn't a notion of human rights, per se, in the Chinese view of the world. You know, there isn't a promise. Uh, and if you look at the, the classic stories, these are not morality tales. The Chinese way of storytelling is very, very comfortable with things that are, aren't completely wrapped up and delivered to you in a bow. They're very, very comfortable with sadness, with tragedy, with you know melodrama, with things that are kind of uh, absolute no-nos here. So when people will walk out of a movie theater, they want to feel like they understand life. They, they've seen a moment of reality. They feel good. The characters go on and they ride off into the sunset. You look at Chinese films. Oftentimes, that's not the case. You know, there's, a, there's an ambiguity, there's an openness. Uh, and on this point, I don't think there's an absolute right or wrong. I think it's every story in, is now in a position to push those boundaries. I, you can't say that the American people is absolutely not capable of accepting uh, these amb ambiguous endings. That's not true because the moment you say that, somebody, somebody's going to be out there and make a movie and prove that statement wrong. Shut around. There you go. Only so, Hollywood executives. Only Hollywood. We were having this conversation yesterday, Bill. So I think it's, it's really wide open and, and it's really now in a nebulous world. And I think, so in a way, I do think there's a lot that China can learn from the three act structure and they're really learning that in spades. But I think the reverse is also going to be true that there's elements of these aesthetics, this way of life, this understanding that's also going to. Uh, you know, influence the other side. And we work with a lot of American writers and we send them to China and say, you're not just there to, to learn, to, to, to teach, you're there to learn. And whatever you learn, these new experiences could be, I think in, a, in, in, in some way, add some new blood to Hollywood, which is just all about remaking things that have already been done a hundred times. So Steve, when you're in the middle of deal making, uh, do issues like uh, censorship, and the kinds of creative compromises you'll have to make in order to make a successful co-production. Does that side come up? It comes up all the time. Um, <clears throat> both to qualify for 
an official co-production, both in terms of different parties, the two parties thinking about who their consumers, who their audience is going to be. So we have the discussion that, for example, money isn't going to flow until the screenplay has been approved by SARF. We may have holdbacks on money flowing until the picture itself has been approved by SARF. SARF, the government the, agency. The, the government censorship aspect. Um, we're going to have issues about, uh, you know, getting technical about holdbacks, meaning what day can the film be released in China versus the rest of the world. So we'll negotiate about whether the film can actually be released outside of China first or how many days first. So we'll get into a lot of minutia that will qualify the film or the project in question for co-production or whether monies will flow under certain circumstances, when the film can be released, and other things such as who can be, you know, the, the casting. One of the interesting examples we have now, and you talk about cultural acceptance, Expendables did very well as an independent film in China. So Avi Lerner got smart as the producer of Expendables and said, now I'm going to try to make the next one as an official Chinese co-production and add Donnie Yen as a cast member. And that goes back to the, the commercial point that Peter was making, which is, yes, it's shooting in Bulgaria, <laughs> but it may still qualify as an official co-production, which will change its opportunities in China for distribution and possibly allow it to exceed Expendables. On the other hand, Maybe it will, maybe it won't. It's a Money, twenty million dollar movie. <laughs> Mike, uh, you are known as a human rights advocate and active in uh, international causes. Uh, do you anticipate that issues of creative content will come up in your picture? And how will you deal with it if it does? Uh, well, you know, in a period picture, it's somewhat different, right? I mean, the the, the issues are somewhat different. Uh, I mean, in that one, it's pretty clear, you know, who's black and who's white, essentially, if you want to put it that way. You know, I mean, Japanese weren't exactly known as being benefactors of the chi of, chi of Chinese or China. Um, so I don't, I don't expect that to come up as, a, as an issue in, in what I'm doing. Uh, you know, I leave um, politics aside when I make films. I don't, I don't go around, you know, trying to sell my point of view. In, in political terms on in films it's just you know I like making a, a really good story if that's the you know I was having a conversation as a matter of fact on this topic yesterday with somebody on the issue of you know um, racism in general um, you know it, it's essentially a, we were talking about what they were talking about how do you get the message on to TV and movies on racism and you know, it's 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 getting to what it is now. What is racism now? How does it manifest itself? And how do you portray it so that people can understand it and be sympathetic to a point of view? So that's a you know, it's a different different set of circumstances. Uh, public diplomacy and soft power. Uh, is a topic that came up earlier today in, in, in the first panel, and it's something that's in, in the current debate about the way in which America exports its values through its entertainment, especially the power of movies, and other countries are doing the same. Incidentally, you know, I've read the book. On I do indeed. <laughs> Mike Medavoy and Nathan Gardell's, the title is? It's called uh, um, American Idol After Iraq. So, American Idol after Iraq, Amazon available. So, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, Bill, uh, to what degree does what story you're telling to other people about American values play into your decisions about movie making? Well, I mean, I think you're. I think I'm probably closer to Mike, but you're. I'll go back to the the Sam Goldwyn old quote of you have a message, send it via Western Union. If anybody remembers what Western Union was. <laughs> um, so the quote doesn't work quite as well as it used to. But the you know the I think you're you're always looking for you know what what the story is and, and that's true. It's even more true when you're a producer because you're you're only picking the stories that are interesting 
to you, you hope other people are also interested in them, but you're being driven less by the, what's the world that I'm playing into? When you're running a studio, you're trying to ascertain how does it not only work in, in Peoria, how does it work in Tokyo, and how does it work in, in Buenos Aires? So those things, you start, there is a commonality to what does work, and, and you know, you're, you're not gonna do something that has domestic issues, which in America would be black and white issues and things like that. You, those, those movies you make for America, you don't make them to be sent overseas. And when you're looking for a movie that plays around the world, there's, there's a commonality of, can I see, I guess the thing I always ask myself is, 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 is there, can I empathize and see myself as that character, whether we were doing Titanic or you're doing Braveheart, you know, I'm, if I'm looking at a 13th century Mel Gibson in, in, in a blue face and kilts, can I can I see myself in that in that role? Can I see myself as Leo on the Titanic, with, you know, doing the heroic thing? So those are those things don't they trans um, whatever they, they get past any cultural transcend, transcend any cultural barriers. And when you're looking from that kind of perspective, you, that's what you're looking for. How is my character human, not how is it American or how is it Chinese? I do tell people who are about to invest in movies is generally asking them why they're doing it and then telling them that if they're expecting a return, and that's one of the reasons they're doing it, that they're probably better off putting it elsewhere and going with real estate or biotech or other industries. If they have other strategic reasons for wanting to invest in motion pictures, which would be what? Like, glamour? Using my financing deal, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> You're not coming into that room. What would be those other motives? <laughs> Tell the truth. The, it, it depends. Hanging around with stars? No, well, it depends. A, or let, let's differentiate between different types of money. There's strategic money. If you're a distributor in China, or Germany for that matter, and you're investing in a film, you already know what your marketplace is, and you know how you're recouping your money as a distributor. So that's strategic money, and that's very different than, let's say, a high net worth individual who comes into the marketplace, and that exists everywhere in the world. In China, they're referred to as the coal miners. In right, yes, the coal mining money, as the, the, the nouveau riche who want to invest in films. In Russia, it's Russian oligarchs. In, in the United States, it's somebody who just made a lot of money in tech, or whatever it is. Um, if you're a high net worth individual and you're investing in motion pictures, I come across a variety of different <coughs> motivations for doing it. Some of it is the glamour aspect, the glamour and glitz. Some of it is the message movies. People who really want to get a message out there, they want to be making message movies and want to invest in message movies. Others simply have a creative streak that perhaps wasn't satisfied in their career while they were making money in real estate or what have you, this affords them the outlet for that creative passion and the storytelling that they want to engage in. Others have the conquering motive. I conquered the automotive industry, I conquered real estate, this is an industry I can conquer as well, I'm gonna be just as smart or smarter than they are. So you come across a wide variety of motivations if you're talking about ego. Ego. If you're talking about the high net worth individual, as opposed to what I'll call strategic money. Uh, Bill, I'm going to ask you to comment, but I, I will also want to get to Janet because you brought a clip. Did you not? I, promise, I did promise to behave. If you hate it, you say nothing. If you love it, you tell me. <laughs> so, do you need to set up the. Uh, uh, somebody has the DVD. No, I meant uh, uh, in terms of story. Oh, yes. Okay. The, the, are we showing it? Or yeah. We're going to show it. Sorry. Uh, the, believe it or not, we, we're thinking of changing the title. Sarah's agent does not like the title that we've been using, which is America Town Shanghai. We can vote about that. But the story is of a Chinese-American lawyer who is on his track to become a partner at a very big, prestigious Wall Street law firm. And he gets the shock of his life one day when his bosses call him into the office and they tell him he's going to China. He is going to open up an office in Shanghai. And this was not what he had in mind for his life. So, but he wants to make partner, he wants to do it. He does not speak Chinese. So that's the basic premise. He goes and the, uh, let's see, the, the, thing, the two things I did tell you, there's three different clips on this DVD, I believe. 
The first one should be self-explanatory. He just arrived in China and he's rushing to the office to get to a meeting. The second clip is uh, a, a lunch that he has with a woman who's his relocation specialist. She's a, a, a blonde American woman who's been living in China for many years and speaks very good Chinese and is raising her daughter there. And the third one is at, right after a meeting he's had with a Chinese manufacturer that he believes has stole his client's technology. It's with this Chinese manufacturer and the person that he believes to be the lawyer, the Western lawyer that the Chinese manufacturer hired uh, to, for this case. Can you remember all that? I'm sorry to compliment. So we have in this room uh, people who are uh, students of uh, China, Chinese film, people in the industry on the U.S. side who want to be in that space, as they say in the business, uh, from the creative side, from the production side, from the finance side. And I'm just wondering if you could give a piece of free advice to any of those constituencies here as they contemplate doing that, what would you say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so just on. Um, probably, as was indicated actually by the clips that we saw. Which, um, by the way, uh, another round of applause, yeah. yeah. We love it. identification, forget the fact that I'm a lawyer. I've been that guy with the map in that cab. Um, the only thing she didn't show was that in the other instance, it's not that it's two feet away from you, but it's an hour away from you in heavy duty traffic. Um, half a mile away, exactly, and you're going around. Anyway, uh, so I definitely identify with that then. Um, I think probably this is this is really obvious in a way, but I think too few people actually do it, which is doing your homework. There are a lot of resources out there to understand what it is you're about to embark upon. Uh, the CFCC regulations, the regulatory body that Peter knows very well, they have a lot of the regulations that are up on the website. Um, there are a lot of resources, written blogs, otherwise people to understand what it is you're doing when you're trying to go over there and do business. So do your homework, and just like in Hollywood, it's not so much about what you know, it's also about who you know. Um, the identity of your co-producing partner, their strength in the marketplace, their reputation, their government relations, everything about who it is, is gonna be absolutely critical to the success of passing SARF censorship, getting your film into the marketplace, and getting it distributed. Here. I think for the American-based entertainment professional coming over to China, for maybe for the first time, I think you know part of it is the homework. I think it's to also do a very thorough kind of internal fact check. I find that a lot of my colleagues have rather outdated views of what China means, how certain practices are, certain taboos, or how Chinese people are. And, and, and sometimes if your information is two years old, it's no longer relevant. So I think it's just really be current, be as current as you possibly can be. And uh, I think to be as pragmatic as one can be. You know, we've all seen, I think there's also the type that it's my way or this way, so you know, that kind of thing just doesn't go too far. So I think it's part of the disposition and there's softer, there, there's kind of just preparing your business persona to engage in that marketplace because what, the elements for success in that environment and this environment are very, very different. So just knowing you kind of have to change your mindset a little bit and it doesn't happen in one day. I would say, first of all, know very clearly why you're going. Do not be chasing some unrealistic dream. Go with your eyes wide open and know that you are going for something that is, a, for a reason that is meaningful and authentic to you. Not because China is the next big place where some, you know, dreams will, will come true. And you have, I think, patience and lack of arrogance are probably the key ingredients to getting along. It's a very different culture. 
Uh, I like it because I feel there is less ego involved in general, but it's very tricky because there, the things are not so obvious all the time what is actually being meant when something is said, and it's not, it, there's, it, it's, it's round and not square. When you were talking about the square thing, I don't know. If China is more round and things are not so clear cut and black and white and definitive, you have to be able to live with ambiguity. Um, each one of them, I think, has given you a really good um, piece of advice along the way, so I'm not going to go back to what they've said. I, I agree with everything that was said. Uh, you know, you come, there, there are different times in your, in your career which you do different things. It's not always going to be the same. If you are young and eager and you can see that the world is changing, um, and you want China to be a part of that, that, you, you know, that is important to you, um, then obviously you do every one of these things. You learn what it is that exists within the scope. You, you also know, it's no different actually in America. You, you know, if you get into this business, um, it's not easy. It's, Basically, you get to meet a lot of people, know everybody. I mean, I had a plan when I got into it. I decided I was going to meet everybody at the time, at least once. Uh, so I made a list of everybody who was in town, and I made it a point to go meet everybody. Here, obviously, they're you know several you know thousands of miles away. Um, the core of what you're trying to do, if it's movies or television or any kind of software. Um, is something that um, I think there, there's a universal language, just a different way to get to it, different way to get to it. If it's just money that you're going after, I don't think that's going to work. I mean, I think it's just folly to that, that think that they're going to do basically what the Japanese or what Sony did when they invested in, 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 Columbia, in bought Columbia Pictures. Um, they don't seem to be in that business. They may. At some point, they may decide that that was the best way to do it. But I think it, it's probably not going to happen, certainly within my lifetime, which, uh, you, know, I, you know, let's assume that I live another 25 years. Um, it, so I would say, you know, it goes to the, what it is, what picture do you want to do, or what set of pictures. I would agree with, with Janet that, you know, we get a little tired of doing the 4th or 5th century China or the 12th century China. I think it's interesting to them, but I think at this point, I, they probably are getting bored with it. Um, so what's the, what stories are universal? You know, what, you know, you've learned a lot. If you make films here, you've learned a lot about how to make films here. You know how to tell a story. You know what stories work. Uh, you've been reading novels or scripts or whatever else there is for umpteen years and you start to say, okay, what is it <clears throat> that's universal that could work everywhere because people are interested in it? Once you've decided on that, then you go through the plan and you meet someone like Stephen or you get a list of people that know what they're doing and start going through that list of things that you have to do. Once you've done that, then figure out how you put the financing together. You know, who, what do you have to cobble together to get it done? And then the biggest problem, as I've said, is how do you get it distributed? Because without that, you can't get the money. Thank you. Okay, Sim simply let me go back to, I guess, the two things. One is from the beginning of dumb money, of why is money dumb? Because it's chasing things for the wrong reasons. And what are people on the other side doing? They're just looking for money. So those two things are almost always eventually going to lead to failure. So I'd say the best piece of advice is have integrity with, of what you're doing. Of you have a story you, and you run into too much government censorship, you probably should make the movie. If you, Janet, had the opposite experience of, of, um, of, of a studio wanting to make a movie ignoring the marketplace in a lot of ways. That's just as, that's just as bad and you're not gonna make anything that's real, valuable, lasting, 
more worth the two or three or five or ten years, depending on how long it takes, which right now is taking a really long time to make movies. If you really care about what you're doing, then you stick to your guns and you make the movie in the manner that you want to make it in. And if it makes sense to do it as a co-production in that manner, then you will do that. And if it doesn't, you should not compromise the material and, and find your money elsewhere. When we began, I said that you couldn't imagine a better group of people to get an insider's perspective of what Hollywood, the entertainment industry, thinks about movie making entertainment in China. And uh, I hope you would agree with me that it wasn't just blowing smoke. Please thank the panel.